Hi, I'm Dr. Alex Mosley, co-founder and editor of the Economic Circle Digital Magazine. In this short video, what I'm going to do is open up the idea of what economics is all about. It is an amazing subject and we live in very interesting times. Hardly a day goes by without somebody maligning economics, blaming it for the actions of governments or of corporations. Now that's a bit like blaming chemists for industrial pollution or for um, GM crops or something. The science behind it is just science. The economics behind economics is a logical study and we can't blame economics itself for what people do or don't do. In fact, often what people are doing with economics is acting against the principles and against the logic of economics, uh, which renders it susceptible to blame for loads of things. Now, in this video, what I want to do is just quickly introduce to you how we can start looking at the world through economic eyes. And it's the most fascinating thing. You take a very different perspective once you know how to look at the world using economic logic. Now, economic logic is about how people act. It's less about the why we do things. That's, a, that's psychology. And we don't really care or shouldn't really care whether people are rational or irrational in their choices, you know, from a third party point of view. And we don't really care whether they're short sighted or long sighted, although there are consequences that we can understand when people act irrationally, i.e. against their own interests, or short sightedly, again, against their own interests for the long run. Too often people are getting caught up by saying that economics is false because people are irrational. We know people are irrational. We know people are emotional. We act very short-sightedly at times. But really, the logic doesn't care about that. We leave that to the psychologists to work out. What we're interested in is the consequences of that behaviour, regardless of our judgments of how people are acting. Now, let's say some people are acting irrationally, going against their long-term interests or against what is for their health or for their finances, etc. Well, we often think there's a certain tipping point that comes when we may change our behaviour. We realise that the costs involved are increasing so much that we need to change our behaviour and do something differently. Now, of course, that may mean when people have become very sick, if it's about their health, or financially bankrupt, at which point we get a huge signal that what we've been doing isn't working and we need to change. Now, economics is like this. However, in the political field, we find governments and politicians often running with theories, running with ideas and policies and interventions that cause more chaos, rising unemployment, rising inflation, and they ignore that because the costs do not fall upon them. So while we can accept that people act irrationally, the economist is interested about well, what will be the logical result of their acting irrationally. And can we point this out to them? Now, whether they accept it or not is up to the people involved. But it is, in, one of the, in the words of a great economist, um, Ludwig Mises, economics is a thankless task. We look at the world through different eyes. And when we look at the world through different eyes, we see the costs involved and what we've given up in all the actions that we do. We can look at horrendous events around the world, such as famines or hyperinflations, and we can point the finger at the logic that is creating that, and behind that, the choices that were made to create such chaos. So we're very much interested in the logic of how people act. They are often aiming towards certain ends, but we can point out, well, you're not going to reduce unemployment if you follow XY policy, for example. Now, people may not like to hear that, but that's their problem. It's not the problem of economics. When we look at the world through economic eyes, we look at how we choose. When we make a choice, if we're by ourselves, we make a choice, we are choosing a priority over other things. We choose to do X over Y. And in basic economics, we call that choice the opportunity cost. We've given up Y to do X. So you're listening to this video now rather than, say, chatting to a friend or going to the pub or watching a DVD or a YouTube video because you think you might get something out of this video. And in a way, this is what we need to raise to our consciousness as economists. So every time we do something, whatever we're choosing to do, we're giving up doing something else. And we always have to weigh the costs and benefits to find out, well, by investing my time in listening to a video on basic economics, am I learning something 
which will then empower me to do other things better. Well, I hope so, and that's what the economic circle is all about, empowering us and ensuring that we gain better grades if you're taking economics as a course, or a better understanding of the choices you make in business or in your professional life. So when we choose to do something, we give something up. When we enter the marketplace, which is much more complicated, we are also giving something up. We're giving up money in return for a service or a product. Now, what becomes fascinating there, if you imagine in your mind supermarket shelves and you buy one coffee and not another, you are voting for the coffee that you've bought. You're voting for the stream of producers and distributors and retailers engaged in that particular economy and not buying another company's. So as a vote for this candidate and not for that candidate, we've given up that which we didn't buy. Now, of course, if you're in business, you may be wanting to attract people over to that market, to that product that's not selling so well by dropping the price or advertising it better. That's what economics is about, the logic of trying to engage people in the marketplace and say, well, can we buy, can we get them to buy more of this? As a consumer, you're on the other side of the equation. You want to get value for money in the things that you're purchasing. And we hope through the economic circle that you'll be getting value for money by hooking into our economic circle digital magazine. That's coming out soon and we'll be doing regular articles on helping you understand economics better either as a student or professional. Right, so we're looking at logic. Now if you're a student of history or of philosophy or of politics, it's a fantastic idea to learn about economic logic. And let me throw in geography there. Um, often geographers espouse um, economic ideas and really there's no logic behind what they do. They create fearful scenarios of human population overrunning the ability to feed it, which can happen, of course, but they ignore the production side. They ignore the fact that we can produce more and there is enough abundance in this world to feed everybody. It's just how do we do it is an economic problem, yes? Or they may ignore the fact that as we consume more oil, the price of oil goes up, which is in encourages us to ration our oil consumption and find other alternatives of energy. This is what economics is about. It's not about sticking our head in the sand and going, oh my God, everything's a disaster. Um, it's not the dismal science that it's paraded to be at times by some thinkers, going back a couple of hundred years. It's about how can we make the best opportunities of what we've got using the logic of economics to help us understand things better. We also, through our looking at the world through different eyes, look at questions such as, why do professional footballers in the Premier Division earn more than nurses? When a lot of people think, well, nurses surely do a better job. They help people um, get better in things. Well, there's economics behind that. And whether we like football or not, or nurses or not, uh, we can certainly understand the logic behind why the footballers earn more. And if you wanted to make a value decision and say, well, I don't like footballers earning so much, we don't buy the product. It's quite simple. You disengage yourself from the market and you go and support your local nurses and purchase more of their services. That's what economics teaches us. We may also be interested in big problems such as what caused the Great Depression of the 1930s and the Greater Depression, as it's called, of the 2010s that we're currently in. What caused it? Now, there's raging arguments behind that. But as economists, we want to get to the logic, test the validity of the logic that's provided to see if the arguments paraded make sense. We're also encourage, uh, encourage us to look at what kind of money holds its value. Is it gold? Is it paper? Is it Bitcoin? And what do these uh, different varieties of money mean in the marketplace? Why do traders um, try to find a money that holds its value over time? We're fascinated by those issues and the economics of money. Should we be worried about deflation? Again, barely a week goes by without various um, economic pundits or media people, journalists, saying deflation is horrifying, it's a really bad thing. Yet in the end of the 19th century, for 50, 60, 70 years, whatever it was, in 19th century Britain, prices fell. But the poor got richer, the rich got richer, everybody got richer. And at the end of the day, the country was better off in terms of GDP, in terms of standard of living than any before. Yet it was a time of great deflation. So we have to look at the economics and the logic of that to test whether the pundits' arguments actually make sense and whether it is something to worry about, and if it is, under what circumstances. We're also fascinated, as I've hinted above, by the effects of policies. When the government intervenes in the economic uh, marketplace, 
or increases government expenditure through hospitals, the military, etc. These have economic effects, and often the effects are not what the governments actually want to happen. But economists can point out the inexorable logic of their policies and say, by doing this, you're going to increase inflation. By doing this, you're going to reduce economic growth prospects. By doing this, you're going to increase unemployment. Whether you like that or not, that's what's going to happen. And economics is very hard on that. Um, now, there are many people out there in the economics world who ignore the logic, and we have to be aware of that in the economic circle. Uh, we're going to have a column called the Chimp Column, <laughs> named after Dr. Steve Jones's Chimp Paradox, where people get involved in the subject emotionally and say, injustice is unfair, there's too much poverty in the world, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. And we want to get through those chimp statements, those emotional statements, to find out what is the logic, what are the repercussions, and what can we do about it, right? And finally, one of the things about the economic circle that we really want to help people with is how can we improve our wealth prospects using economics? For example, if you're about to buy a house, but your economic logic tells you we're at the top of a business boom here and house prices are starting to get carried away, it might not be the best time to buy a house. We're not financial advisors. We're not here to offer you professional advice on your income and what your borrowing requirements are and your credit ratings, etc. But we can certainly help with economic logic and say, look, in a boom, prices will come down. In a recession, prices generally recover at some point. We don't know when. But at some point, so buying a huge investment, uh, capital investment such as buying a block of flats or an office building or a house for, uh, for your own home at the top of the business boom may not be the best idea. And we can use economics to see how that's going to work. So we're quite keen in the economic circle to draw on the economic logic and say, hey, guys, we can also use this to understand when to get in the marketplace, when to get out. For particular markets, macro markets, so for example, uh, is India a good buy at the moment if you're buying mutual funds into that area? As I say, we're not investment brokers, we're not financial advisors, but we can certainly teach you the economics to give you the tools to empower you to improve your wealth prospects, right? That's the opening, and we look forward to conversing with you, corresponding with you, uh, getting feedback on our videos and our articles. And if there's something you're desperate to learn about, send us an email. Very keen to work with you. The Economic Circle is about embracing the logic and also embracing the audience of people who want to learn more about economics. Thanks for listening. Uh, it's been great talking to you and I hope you've enjoyed that. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks very much.